Otavai, and I'm an artist. But even more than an artist, I like to call myself a maker. When I was younger, I rarely let my parents throw anything away. I always wanted the cardboard to, to build a doll house out of it, or if there were scraps of anything. And back in the day, we went to church and wore pantyhose. I wanted the little cardboard out of the pantyhose because everything had the potential to be something else, everything. I don't even know if I chose this. I think it kind of chose me. I went to a college for high school, um, North Carolina School of the Arts. So you have high school, undergrad, and grad school on the same campus. So I applied to go there without telling my parents. So my dad had to drive me to the interview. And he got up there and he saw the blue hair and the weird clothes. I was like, I don't know, but my later drawing teacher said, this is her tribe. You should let her come. And so that kind of started my formal training. So I went there for high school, studied fashion design in college. And and later in life, I got my master's in art education. So it's always been a part of my, my DNA. Ironically enough, I'm the artist child of scientist parents. My mother was a chemist working at Duke back when black people nor women worked there. And my dad, who's still living, is a retired entomologist. And I used to get up early in the morning and go with him to his lab when he would let me. I love nature, run around in the forest, and grew up with these very science-minded people. And so though I'm creative, I'm very logical in my thinking as well. And, and both of those have shown up later. The science feeds the art, the art feeds the science. And even now my dad and I have great conversations around how spirituality, creativity, and the sciences are intrinsically linked. It's a world that separates. They're all tethered together in some way, all of them. I am not driven by what other people think about me. I'm not driven by what it, other pe people think I should do with my gifts and talents and abilities. You know, as an artist, someone's like, oh my gosh, you should do this, or you should paint this, or my favorite line is, oh, you're an artist? You should draw me. I, I don't want to. <laughs> I could, but I don't want to. And I think that for me, I make what comes through my spirit. Whatever it is, and it shifts. If you look at the diversity of my work, they're like, you did that one? Wait, and that one too, and that one? There's no cohesive look to my work yet. And maybe because I'm still exploring, but whatever comes to my spirit in that moment, that's what I make, and I honor that. Now, when I'm done, you can buy it. Let me be clear. I'm not down for being one of them starving artists. When I'm done, but I don't let anyone dictate to me what it is I make, what my process is, and what the outcome is at all. I love watercolor because it's so unforgiving, but it's quick. I love acrylic. I, I consider my, even though you see me painting, I consider myself a textile artist. I do a lot of art books. I love painted textiles and doing that. I, I've done oils. I, I love it, but I don't love it. Only reason, it's so expensive. And I started oil painting. I've been working on it for years because like, yep, I'm out of that color. Oh, but I'll see you again in a couple of years. <laughs> And it's a like slow medium, and you know, everything now is like quick, quick. We want it now. My creative process often starts in desperation. <laughs> I've been driving down the road and had to pull over. I always have a sketchbook with me at all times to pull over to document an idea. I don't keep a sketchbook like a lot of artists where there's lots of drawings and lots of, mine is more note taking word cues so I can remember what it was I want to do later. If I'm doing a series, I'll do really, I mean, rough sketches. A la Frida Kahlo a few years ago, my sketchbook is all, I blended my sketchbook and my journal. So they're not separate. So the narrative to my life, along with what thoughts I was thinking are there at the same time, and I'll go back through them and be like, oh, that's what I was thinking. And I can pull the visual image from where I was emotionally. And that leads me to, okay, I'm here, I'm ready to make this piece. When I had children, especially sons, I realized I needed to engage something more feminine. So most of my art is the story of black women and girls in particular. I always feel like um, our stories are told visually and incorrectly. Uh, my master's degree paper was actually called 
aesthetic discrimination, black girls and invisibility in art education. And I felt like we lose a lot of black women to art and creativity because the imagery of, is negative or they don't see themselves at all. I purposefully and intentionally put us in work. Anybody else that's in my work is a footnote because I want to highlight us as black women and girls of the diaspora and have us shown in beautiful moments and tender moments and moments as mothers and moments as partners and moments as being in transformation. But it's all woman-centered specifically about black women. I need to see me in my own work every single time. I love the colors in nature, the greens, the blues, um, the browns, with moments of warmth, like orange from the terracotta desert and sun. The more natural palettes, and I may, you know, you may some, see some acidy yellow in it, a highlight, but it's always highlighting what's already there. And I think I'm leaning even more towards that natural palette. Very rarely do I use purple or red. Red feels violent to me. <laughs> <laughs> so if I have red, it's very intentional, but rarely, that's one of the colors I rarely use in my work. I don't know why, even for backgrounds or little moments. Life happens and it comes at us fast. I'm a single mother, I've been for years. I'm a teacher, and educator. I have other things that I enjoy as well. I love to read, I'm a voracious reader. And so choosing time where I set aside time specifically for this. Like, I, you need to paint, you need to make, because we're not gonna be okay in two days if you don't get to this. Like, literally, my spirit gets disrupted. I think one of the challenges is, even though I'm an artist, I'm like one of those responsible type A artists. My bills are paid, I like things just so. And so to have things in order so I feel free to be able to create undisturbed, like I can lock and load for two days, because I've taken care of the responsibilities. You know, some days I'm just, I wish I could just be irresponsible, just like, I'm gonna paint for the next two weeks, leave me alone, but I, but I can't. And I think that's the hardest challenges most artists face. You know, you want to live a, a healthy and productive life, but you also wanna be in that creative zone and to get snatched out of that because you have responsibilities, finding that balance. And I don't know that there is a balance. I think we're all seeking it. I think the best way to balance and maintain is to be around other artists, be in community. You don't know what you're doing for somebody or what somebody's doing for you in that moment, but it all is kind of like, it's like spiritual nourishment, it's like food. Like you need to talk to other creatives, you need to see what other creatives are doing. And it really does make the moments where you can't do or don't have to do more palatable. Because I'm, I'm not ever gonna stop doing this. I mean, I think if I lost, lost my arms and legs, I would have to figure out my how to paint with my mouth. Like, people think making and creating is a choice. I never believed that. I came here with this. Um, even to the point my students, I tell them I'm not an art teacher. I'm an artist who happens to teach you, and I don't teach creativity. I excavate. It's there. I'm just helping you dig through the muck to get to that part of yourself. I think if other people walk away and they felt provoked in some way by my work, I'm okay with it. Good, bad, ugly. If they felt something, I feel like I've done my part with them. For me, when I look at my work and I sit with my work and my writing, I just want to create in a way that says I was here. Even if I never become prolific, if my stuff is never in a museum, if no one ever pays me the thousands and thousands of dollars for my work, one, I'm still gonna create it, but it is also a um, artifact that says I was here. And that's, I, I think, would be the thing I would want to be the most lasting thing about me. Hi, I'm Coach Vi. I'm an artist and a maker, and this is my voice, and this is my life.